Have you ever felt stuck, whether that be within yourself or in something in your relationship? And when that happens, have you ever felt the effects of anxiety or depression kind of creeping their way in? Well, you may know that intimacy is important, but today we're going to show you how you can use intimacy to help you transform, to help you get unstuck, and to help you heal, especially trauma and attachment injuries. That's the path we're going to be following in today's episode. Now, you may also hear that I have a little touch of a cold in my voice, but I want you to know that I did not have a cold when I was speaking to today's guest, Diana Fosha. So even though Chloe has tried to convince me that this sounds very sultry, um, I'm glad that you're only going to have to bear with me with this uh, creaky voice for the next minute or so. So just a reminder, Relationship Alive is an offering from me to you to help you have the most amazing relationship possible. If you are finding the show to be helpful for you in your life, please consider a donation to show your support for the podcast and help ensure that we can continue. To choose something that feels right for you, just visit neilsatin.com slash support or text the word support to the number 33444 and follow the instructions. And this week, I want to send a big thank you out to Stephanie, Lita, Denise, Kelly, Kent, and Sarah. Thank you all so much for your generous support of Relationship Alive. And as you may know, the path to deeper intimacy involves better communication. If you haven't grabbed it yet, please download my free Relationship Communication Guide that contains three communication secrets that will help you stay connected no matter how challenging the thing is that you're communicating about. To pick up the free guide, all you have to do is visit neilsatin.com slash relate, or you can text the word relate to the number 33444 and follow the instructions. And also, just a quick reminder that if you're on Facebook and haven't already joined us, please come find the Relationship Alive community, where we have more than 2,500 people who listen to the show and where we've created a safe space to have conversations about you and your relationships and to get support. So that's the Relationship Alive community on Facebook, and I look forward to seeing you there. All right, let's dive in and get on with the show. Hello and welcome to another episode of Relationship Alive. This is your host, Neil Satin. You know, intimacy is a powerful thing, super powerful. It brings us together with our partners and enables us to achieve more than we would be able to on our own. And yet, sometimes we get stuck and things don't flow quite so well. And that could be a stuckness that happens in our relatedness, in our relationship with our partner, or it could be more like an inner stuckness where you feel like you're not being quite as effective as you'd want to be in your life, or you feel the effects of depression or anxiety, the kinds of things that hold you back where you know that you might not be shining your brightest. And yet intimacy has this amazing transformative power in how it gives us access to these deeper parts of ourself. And I'm bringing this up because today's guest is a master of creating intimacy in a therapeutic setting in a way that helps clients make huge changes in terms of their experience of their own lives. The name of her therapeutic modality is AEDP, or Accelerated Experiential Dynamic Psychotherapy. Now that sounds like a mouthful, it is a mouthful, but what you are going to discover in today's episode is just how simple it can be to affect 
profound transformation, all through harnessing who we innately are as humans, as feeling creatures. And I know we're called homo sapiens. We are people who know, but uh, I believe that it's also important to acknowledge how we feel and that our feelings as many illustrious people before me have noted, are part of what has allowed us to adapt to our world in ways that are beneficial to our survival and also to our enjoyment of life and living. So today's guest is none other than Dr. Diana Fosha, who, along with being the creator of AEDP, is also the author of The Transforming Power of Affect, a Model for Accelerated Change. And her modality uses attachment science, interpersonal neurobiology to help therapists, again, create amazing changes or facilitate amazing changes in their clients. And I think there's also a lot that's useful just for us to learn here about how we operate as people that we can take into our lives and into our relationships in order to enhance our experience. And we're even going to talk about that process of enhancing our experience in today's conversation. So I think that's it from me, along with just mentioning that if you want a detailed transcript of today's conversation, you can visit neilsatin.com slash FOSHA, F-O-S-H-A, which is Diana's last name. Or as always, you can text the word passion to the number 33444 and follow the instructions. I think that's it. So Diana Fosha, thank you so much for being here with us today on Relationship Alive. Such a pleasure to be in conversation with you, Neil. Thank you so much for the invitation. You are most welcome. And I, I hope I encapsulated everything in a way that, that makes sense. But we are, of course, going to dive in a little more deeply and help everyone understand what AEDP is all about. You absolutely did a stellar job. And it's actually a wonderful thing to sort of hear my work sort of mirrored and condensed in that way. So um, I think we, we're off to a good start. Excellent. Excellent. Well, to to condense it and mirror it even further, because I've had people ask me, like, what is that? And what's that big book you're reading? Because I've been carrying around the transforming power of affect with me for probably the better part of the past month. And uh, and and who is this person? And, and the way that I've explained it to them is that by creating safety in the, in the therapeutic setting. So creating a therapist creating enough safety so that you can experience the core emotions that contain within them the power to transform your experience. That's great. What shall we do for the rest of the hour? <laughs> <laughs> well, let's talk about how we get there. And um, maybe you could start by talking about your stand. Because it's clearly super important to you that a therapist be able to participate actively with their clients, as opposed to what I think we tend to think of with our therapist, which is that they're more passive or receptive, or maybe they validate, but they're not necessarily down there in the trenches with us. Right. And I'd be happy to talk about that. And I want to sort of like just take one step back to Great. sort of to the another what I think of as really essential aspect of the model and then we'll go to the stance and then get more deeply into it. And what I want to say is that in addition to the safety that you talked about in terms of the safety to really have people feel safe to come forth with their experience and who they are and then process those emotions. I would say that the most sort of like core, core, core fundamental assumption is that healing resides within us, that it's there from the get-go, side by side with the suffering, the stuckness that you talked about in your introduction, what have you, trauma, depression, difficulties uh, in relationships, whatever it is, 
that that brings people to therapy and accounts for their not being fulfilled or shining as brightly again, as you sort of said it in your introduction, that side by side with that, always, um, there's a capacity for healing that's just absolutely wired into us. And I think that's just something that's a guide and an assumption that actually allows me to sort of sit with whoever I'm working with, just in a confident or comfortable way that what they need is already so much of it is so deeply um, within them if we can just bring it forth. Um, so with that, as I was going to say in the background, but it's not in the background, with that as a foundation, you know, I think that my stance as a therapist is about creating a relationship that the safety really comes from the fact that we actually are two people in the room and acting in that way and that I consider myself part of this healing diet that my patient and I, um, you know, form together and that my experience and my responses, not just my thoughts and not just my words, are really part and parcel of what we're co-creating, you know, that allows the person, hopefully, to start to feel safe from very, very early on. That's the beginning. Yeah, yeah, you, you you speak very eloquently in your book about the importance even of like right from the beginning of the first session to be creating that that context of yeah. safety and and being in it co-creating the process. Yes, you know, I mean I um I really spend a lot of time I do a lot of training of therapists. And one of the things that I like to talk to them about is that the first session is sacred. And it's sacred in one very, very particular way. is the only encounter that we will ever have that has no history. Mm -hmm. That we're creating history in that first meeting. We come to it with no history of each other, even by the second session. We already have an established way of being, not that it can't change, not that it can't be altered. I don't mean that. It's not fixed, but it's history. Whereas in the first session, you have this unique opportunity to define the relationship in particular terms so that I think it's incredibly important so that in ADP, the the first session is not really so much devoted to tell me your way where you were born and how many people in your family and um you know how many therapies did you have you know that kind of history taking which of course is important because it captures information but that information is there for the acquiring in the second session or in the seventh session or in writing or by, you know, a million different ways. But this unique interaction between us, you know, where we're sort of creating something together for the first time, it's a unique opportunity. So therapy really starts from the very, very first moment of that very first encounter. It reminds me of a first date. And, yeah. you know, sometimes that can be a, a degree of pressure that people don't really like. But it's really true that before that moment, you don't have any idea about that person, nor do they of you. And and what I really like is that you're honoring the fact that you're creating a relationship by going to see a therapist. Exactly. In a way, and I like 
the the first date analogy it's a little bit easier in some ways in that there's one person who's sort of in charge <laughs> of setting <laughs> <laughs> so it's not both people you know sort of in one way it is and in one way it isn't there that's why we have roles and right. that's why you're going to see a therapist um but it has some of that unknown and potential and excitement as well as like terrifying aspect of you know being vulnerable with a total stranger who by the second meeting will not be a stranger anymore right and one thing that really of the many there are so many things that actually stood out for me uh, about your work but it was this idea of how so much of our suffering and pain comes from having experiences that occur in isolation where we feel like we can't share them with another person or there's something wrong with us and and you know we have no way of really checking that out because again we're, it's it's all happening inside us and so the power of bringing an acknowledgement to every experience with an AEDP therapist of you're not alone. Like what you just went through right here with me, do you see how we we were in this together? I think that um, that's so crucial. And of course, it's implicit in any relationship or in any therapeutic relationship. Yet the strange thing is that merely by being with another person, whether in conversation or in relationship, does not necessarily automatically translate into not feeling alone. And actually, I think one of the most painful ways of feeling alone is feeling alone in the presence of other people. Um, so that one of the things that I'm very, very, very conscious of is to actually explore together with the person that I'm working with, who I'm working with, what their experience is of our being together, if it feels like we're being together, and they, if they feel accompanied, if they are aware that as they're sharing something or saying something or feeling something or you know, thinking something and saying it out loud, it's actually being registered by another human who's there with them. And that's to actually be able to have that experience of not feeling alone as you're going through something um, is just very powerful and potentially very therapeutic in and of itself. Because, you know, I think as you've said, so much of what becomes our suffering or uh, various forms of it really has something to do with our aloneness and either the fact that there's nobody that we can share it with or the fact that we're experiencing something that absolutely overwhelms our resources, that were we there with somebody else, um, the trauma was, would be as horrible, but our capacity to bear it or deal with it um, would be quite different. There's very, very interesting research that shows that um, for people who are in combat, if they have a buddy that they're going through the combat experience with, their chances of getting PTSD are significantly reduced. And wow. that kind of finding, you know, is present in many, many other settings. Um, 
you know, another, just to mention one other, and uh, sorry, because you're about to say something, you know, there's also, you know, a similar kind of research that uh, during World War II, there were all these kids um, who were orphaned, you know, as their patient, as their parents were taken to concentration camps, and they were actually in a therapeutic home school uh, run by um, Anna Freud and this other woman named Dorothy Burlingham, and they study, they also studied these um, orphans. And what they found out is that, again, that those kids who had somebody they were close to, a sibling or a friend or somebody with whom they felt bonded, were much less traumatized by these most, you know, devastating um of experiences that they were going through. And this actually informs the therapy. What I was going to say is what was striking me in that moment was how, you know, we're here to talk about relationships and it's always such a big irony when things start to get a little uncomfortable in relationship, how theoretically you're there with another person, but you can feel so alone. Mm -hmm. And and I think that that's part of what we're trying to overcome when there are issues in a couple is to remember that they are also there for each other. On the, You know, they're on the same team. They are each other's buddy, which hopefully helps them survive without too much trauma um, that they're inflicting upon each other from that stuck place. Exactly, exactly. And of course, that so many couples um, who come to therapy are in a couple, but the difficulties have been such that they have been feeling very alone. So um, that that's really the paradox that we're, if we're just able to sort of recognize that presence and um, share enough of ourselves that the other person also feels us. We've already done something very significant. Can we talk for a moment about what is it about this model that, like, where does the healing take place? And in particular, I'm thinking about the difference between our core effective emotions and 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 other things that come out as more like our defenses our defensive strategies mm -hmm. yeah i mean the you know uh the healing um there are many opportunities for it and there are many aspects of adp that um, are experienced as healing. We're actually in the process of doing some empirical research into the model. And um, to do so, we needed to create some scales to measure that the therapy is actually happening in some fashion related to how we say it should be happening. And we created a scale to measure change processes. And there are nine. And there could have been more. But I'm trying to <laughs> <laughs> but I'll try to actually reduce it and condense it um, even from the nine. I mean, I think that sometimes what we had been talking about, which is the experience of having one's aloneness undone and feeling seen or feeling cared about or just validated or understood, that in and of itself can be so profoundly transformative, not in and of itself and not forever. But those kinds of moments have... Um, tremendous power. So I think that's one piece. Um, 
I think the other that you were beginning to talk about, which is that when we can't process, we can't um, fully process or express them, feel them, express them, and do something about our emotions, either because they're overwhelming or because we're in environments where our core emotions are met with criticism or with ridicule or what have you, um, we do develop these kinds of protective strategies and um, which work beautifully in the short term. We don't get hurt and we don't get shamed and we don't get overwhelmed. But over time, by relying on them, they sort of, they form almost like a crust, like a shore shell over our hearts and ourselves. And they become sort of like the I who we present to the world. And that person is not authentic or is not our true authentic self. So that just in being able to break through or let go of those protective mechanisms that protect us but also limit us and have the courage to be vulnerable and touch our emotions and start to experience them and express them and process them with another person is another um, huge transformative opportunity, particularly because those emotions are wired into us to help us. Right? That's what Mother Nature, that's why they survived over so many eons and eons of evolution. They're really good for us, even though they're difficult. Um, so that's the second piece. And then I think I've said, so that's sort of three. And I'll mention one other, which I'm sure we'll end up talking about a little more, which is that an ADP in the kind of work, you know, that um, that goes by that name, we do something very, very specific that, to my knowledge, is not done by any other therapeutic model, or it's not done systematically in any case, which is this, that any time um, there's a moment of change for the better, be it big or small, in a given session, we start to focus on the experience of that change, uh, the experience of that moment of transformation. And we've discovered something really cool, which is that when you do that, the experience and the process of change or of transformation grows. Um, and that in and of itself is a huge source of transformative potential. Right. The power of focusing on what's going right versus always being focused on what's going wrong. And as soon as you like fix something, well, let's move on to the next wrong thing as opposed exactly. to. Exactly. Like, okay, now we did that. It feels better. Excellent. Let, <laughs> let's tackle the next thing, which is reasonable enough. Except that there's this other thing that can happen, that when we stay with the positive, when we stay with this thing that has just changed and just gotten better or that feels right, these amazing, cool things happen when we do that. Like what? Like <laughs> that feeling of something right growing and it grows in a way that we can feel it in our bodies literally and you know that we start to feel our chests expanding or we start to feel this kind of streaming of aliveness um but so that's that's one aspect of it and another aspect of it is that one um, 
one feeling of something feeling right or good leads to another. Pride can lead to calm, which in turn can lead to joy. I mean, it varies from moment to moment and from person to person. But all of a sudden, it's like you start with like a little nugget. And it just, or like you start with a seed. You know, there's so many metaphors. You know, and if you sort of nurture this particular seed, it just blossoms, right? We have this term flourishing. Um, and I think that's, for me, one of the coolest things about the therapy, which is that people come in, you know, because they're suffering and they want their suffering relieved. And that's certainly... Um, uh, a fundamental aim of the work, but it doesn't stop at relieving suffering. It continues, sort of organically, seamlessly moves into also creating flourishing, this kind of from like little seeds of growth or little seeds of change and letting them flower. Right, and it makes an intuitive sense to me and and I'm reminded of I can't remember who said it but someone said something about how you you get rid of darkness by shining the light brighter and um by not by taking away the darkness and it, so it makes me think of that that the more you amplify the flourishing and allow that to grow organically um and that brings up a question for me but the more that you do that the um the less room there is for the shadow the dysfunction to to be there and to be a problem i think that's true i think that's true and now we're going to take just a quick moment to talk about this week's sponsor and they have a special offer for you as a relationship alive listener our sponsor today is Audible. You're here listening to Relationship Alive, of course, and along with podcasts, listening to audiobooks can be an amazing tool to motivate you, inspire you, and even bring you closer together with the people in your life. Because audiobooks can help you improve your relationships, as well as your relationship with yourself. Audible has the largest selection of audiobooks on the planet. And now they also make Audible Originals, which is custom content just for Audible members. As a special offer, Audible wants to give you a free 30-day trial, which includes one free audiobook. Go to audible.com slash relationship or text the word relationship to the number 500-500, that's 500-500 to get started. And if you've enjoyed this episode so far, I encourage you to pick up your copy of It's Not Always Depression by Hilary Jacobs Hendel, which has a foreword by our esteemed guest, Diana Fosha. In It's Not Always Depression, Hilary Jacobs Hendel, who is an AEDP practitioner, will teach you why all emotions have value and how to identify not only your emotions, but the defenses that get in the way of your expressing, expressing those emotions, how to get to the root of anxiety, and also how to develop a really strong sense of self-compassion, among many other things. So if you're ready to learn how to reconnect with your true self in It's Not Always Depression, or another audiobook that's calling you, go to audible.com slash relationship or text the word relationship to the number 500-500 to get started with your free 30-day membership. And thank you so much, Audible, for your support of the Relationship Alive podcast. And now let's get back to our conversation with Diana Fosha. So the question, the question was, um, and I do want to go back to, to core affective emotions, but before we do, what are some ways, because I don't know about you, but I've been in situations where someone has shown a spotlight on like how, how good a time we're all having, and it it's actually doesn't amplify it. In fact, it feels almost 
inauthentic or like that person is somehow kind of removed from the moment instead of actually there participating in it with all of us. Um, so what are the qualities of shining a light on positive change or on a, a moment of goodness that actually help create resonance? Right. No, I think that's excellent. So um, first of all, it, it has to come from within the individual who's doing the experience. In other words, it's not the therapist who says, gee whiz, look at that. Isn't that great? Um, you know, which can evoke very much or elicit very much exactly what you're saying. Well, actually, it actually isn't. <laughs> um, you think it may be, but I'm actually sitting here feeling embarrassed or it's evoking a lot of discomfort in me or whatever it is. Right? So that we're always attuning to the experience, the internal experience, uh, so that it's not that it looks like it feels right. It's the person, him or herself, who's really, so that, for instance, if I said, what, what's that like for you? Um, you know, then the person will say, wow, I am really, really aware in this moment that this discomfort that I walk around with usually is just not here. It's crazy, but it's really not here, right? I had this, this woman, and I'm thinking of her as I'm saying this, and I can hear her words sort of echoing um, for me that she kept saying, this is so weird. It's good, but it's so <laughs> weird, right? Because the actual experience of not having the depression or not having the uptightness, it's nice. But if that's what you're used to, right? And like if you're wearing a tight shirt and you've just worn that tight shirt all the time, it's so nice to take it off. And it's also so strange if that's what you're used to, right? So we're just, that's what we're processing. We're processing the person's very sort of granular and very specific um, experience. And, um, you know, as to your point, it's not just a linear process that one good thing leads to another. It can very often lead to another defense or another block or um, all of a sudden self-consciousness or embarrassment or anxiety. I mean, it can go one thing. I'm sort of theoretically talking about what can happen and often does, but sometimes we're as uncomfortable and as embarrassed when we're feeling positive things, they feel exposing, right? So then there's another round of work, be it with protective mechanisms or shame or other traumatic issues that can be brought forth by the positive emotions, right? So it's not like... The A leads to B, leads to C, leads to D. It's very, the process is very individual. And the safety is in staying very connected to what each person's experience really is. And welcoming it. Welcoming it, whether it's good or whether it's difficult. Yeah, and one thing that, in what you just said, that really stood out for me, even just in my initial question, was that it wasn't so much a declaration about, isn't this amazing what just happened? It was more like a recognition that something is happening right now. And, and the question, like, what are you, what's your experience of this that's happening right now? Right. What's this like for you? Yeah. Right. Yeah. Which, I mean, I'm just even thinking in our, in terms of our day-to-day -day lives, the number of times that we make assumptions about what's going on in our partner's worlds versus just asking what's what's going on for you right now what's your what's this like for you that we're experiencing right now 
And oh. may I add, and also listening. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right. It's, it's asking the question, knowing to ask the question and not assume, and then really listening to what the other person has to say because our experiences are so specific to us and those assumptions so often turn out to be surprisingly not true for the other person. There aren't many, actually, which is where I am. Mm -hmm. the, the, the power of... of being accepted, of having someone see... Mm -hmm. Yes, and I'd be happy to try to see if we can. <laughs> right, hook me oh. up, Diana. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. <laughs> I love the matchmaking. <laughs> and we do have a therapist directory, but um, I appreciate what you're saying. It's a powerful thing. Yeah, and so let's talk a little bit more about, because we, we've been generalizing about particular kinds of emotional experiences that contain within it a lot of resource. It's resource for how we show up in the world, how we show up with our partners, um, how we uh, fuel creative endeavors. Um, but they're not, it's not all like, it's not all joy, right? There, there are other em sure. emotions there that are important in terms of their power for us. Yes, yes. Um... Absolutely. I mean, all of the emotions, and there are really two that come to mind um, that I might want to just mention because we, te we tend to, or people often avoid them, and one has to do with grief, and the other is anger. And... I think there's just a, there's something about grief, which is intrinsically painful. Um, grief and sadness about losses and disappointments. And Right, yeah. you even talk about how that can, and this, I, I read this and I was like, yes, of course, how that can come up in a therapeutic setting where something great has just happened and then rather than that feeling amazing, you can feel this overwhelming sense of grief for all the, the missed opportunities or times you didn't feel that when you were younger and, and how important it is to be, to be nurtured through uh, an experience of grief or mourning around those losses. Exactly, exactly. And to just recognize that actually particularly if we're not alone and we're supported and that grief can be witnessed uh, as we're feeling it, actually something very, very important happens that in going through it and going through the process of mourning or feeling our sadness or grief, there is actually, when we come out the other side, there's a tremendous feeling of relief. And, you know, I can feel it sort of as I'm saying it, you know, that I almost feel my chest expanding and I feel, you know, I feel my heart. And, 
you know, all of this kind of energy is not going into containing something, but actually feeling it. It's almost like, you know, you see a movie or a play that's deeply emotional and you're crying and then you come out on the, there's a, there's an openness, you know, or it's sort of like that comes in the wake of the grief, whether it's perspective or acceptance, but there's just something about our organism needs to mourn when we have those losses. And that's part of what psychic health really is. And when we just um, reflexively tighten up so as not to feel it, um, we're putting all our energy into containing something that's natural, that's difficult, but very profound and important. Yeah, something that feels important here is how all of these deep emotions, when you experience them, you get to metabolize them. And and I think that's not always clear to us that like, because grief like the prospect of mourning something important, the loss of a relationship or a, a loved one or a friend or um, an opportunity, it can feel like, well, how will that, like how will going through that pain help me? So I'm gonna, instead, I'm gonna just pretend I'm okay or like I, or like I got over it. Um, right, right, right. And it's sort of, that's what I mean, that these are very sort of like, powerful wired in emotions we have them you know people all over the world regardless of culture experience grief and anger and sadness and fear and joy these are just sort of wired into us and they're also wired into mammals you know they're very very powerful experiences and if we don't fight them and we experience them and metabolize them then um, we're able to really come to terms with whatever these experiences are that evoked them and um, and realize things. So I'll tell you something. A story comes to mind of work that I did many, many, many years ago, pretty early in my career when I was working with a man Um whose father had died when he was a young boy and he was left very alone with that experience. Um, there was the belief in his family that he was too young and therefore nobody talked to him about it. I think under the good intentions of saving him pain, but very misguided intentions, he wasn't allowed to go to the funeral. So he was really... And by the time I met him, several decades later, that wasn't the only thing, of course, but that was a major aspect. So he was a very numb person. He was very numb and dissociative and so on and so forth and quite, quite distant and disconnected from his feelings. And he couldn't have it manifested in his not really being able to have intimacy uh, in his relationships. So after some time, we're finally able to make our way back to the little boy. He was seven or nine or so, I think, when when his dad died. And he really was able to feel the grief and the fear of those early experiences, I think for the, really for the first time, one of the first times, certainly first time with somebody. And it was really, really deep sobs and deep pain. And I just have it as clear as if it had happened a week ago or yesterday of his weeping and the wave of tears ending and his sort of breathing deeply and looking at me and starting to sort of calm um, and his saying, I have to go sit at the grave of my father. And 
which he had never done. And that there was something about the power of that moment, of that knowing of what he needed to do, you know, that only came after um, he went through this deep grieving. I'm feeling really moved by that, just imagining that person's experience and the power of that. And it makes me wonder, how how do we know if we're safe enough to go there? Is it is it a knowing or is it more like a deeper knowing where I'm not, I'm not even sure I'm articulating this question well, but I'm thinking about how often we end up in relationship because you know the the dopamine and oxytocin and you know that potent cocktail that of biochemicals that we get to experience when we're together it gives us that illusion of safety and often there's even this sense of like well, i can tell this person anything or they see me more deeply than anyone ever does and then part of the reckoning that comes later is trying to establish true safety and i'm just Mm-hmm. wondering yeah like how do we if our goal is to really foster that safety where we are allowed to to go to those deep levels of experience and come out the other side metabolizing them what yeah how do we know that we have that um do you you don't mean just in a therapeutic relationship you mean really in the relationships that we have yeah yeah that, Right, right. Because so many of us are are trying to heal attachment wounds, right, and and especially with our partners. Um. Right, right. You know, I mean, I think a couple of things, you know, sort of come to mind in response to that. I think we that's how we gain experience is. You know, the, that sense of when we go to those deep places, how the person that we're with is able to respond and they can listen and empathize and be there. Um, with each time one of these things happen in small ways or large ways, I think that increases our sense, our sense of safety and vice versa that, you know, with that sort of heady cocktail that you're talking about of early days and, um, you know, and then being willing to be really, really vulnerable to only discover that that person then sort of shuts down or disappears or gets critical or, right? So, but then, which are, they're both very um, not unusual experiences. And I think the learning and the intimacy uh, is forged through uh caring about getting better at it and repairing and owning our mistakes and trying again and being willing to risk again. Because I think what's, you know, and that takes me back to what um, I said at the beginning about the healing within the great big assist in all of that is that while we want to feel safe and need to feel safe and we spend so much effort protecting ourselves, there's another way in which we want to be known. We want to, we also, you know, much as that gentleman I was talking about had spent 40 years in numbness and dissociation when he finally felt safe, there was also something in him that needed to grieve and wanted to grieve, right? So it's both. We need to feel safe, but we also want to feel known. And 
that pushes us to take chances and be vulnerable and also the importance and this is what I want to emphasize whether it's therapy or and or life um, to learn to repair because we sure as hell don't get it perfect or just right so much of the time. Yeah, that must be an amazing part of your training for AEDP therapists is that art of repairing with their clients when they've, they haven't they have made quite the right step in terms of an intervention or a noticing. Exactly, exactly. And all of a sudden, you know, the person before you gets defended or spaces out or starts to talk pretty superficially. So there's you know, maybe something got activated for them, but maybe it's something that I, as the therapist, wait a second, um, you know, have I done something? Did I miss that? Did I, you know, or any number of things. And I think the willingness to just want to know and the willingness to own those mistakes or those, yeah, it's so huge. Like, I am so sorry. Please tell me. And, um, you know, let me look in myself. What happened there? What made me space out? What made me um, be insensitive or, you know, say something that, felt unempathic or right let, let let's let's be with that together and let me own my stuff yeah that willingness to to be vulnerable that way as a as a therapist or as a partner to say wow i'm really sorry i clearly messed up just then <laughs> um and and to recognize in that way that you're holding the well-being of the other person within you and and recognizing that you have some responsibility in that moment for that um, yeah yeah you know and i want to say another thing about that that's sort of specific to um how we teach and train in adp which is that we make use of videotape we videotape our session so first of all that requires um you know, our patients trust in allowing us to do that, but patients really want to be seen and very often appreciate the fact that not only do they have their session, but that the therapist is going to look at the session again. Or, But it's the willingness of therapists to be vulnerable in showing their tapes to their supervisors, by the way, tapes, uh, is a dated term. I was going to say. <laughs> <laughs> we, we still call them videotapes. I mean, I haven't had videotapes in like 20 years. <laughs> um, but the language hasn't quite caught up with the technology. You know, but it's the patients allowing the therapist to do that, the therapist being vulnerable in sharing that with their supervisors. And myself and my colleagues who teach AADP are being vulnerable and actually showing our videotapes. You don't have to just, when you're training in AADP, you just don't have to just listen to me tell you, oh, do this and do that. You know, I have to be vulnerable and put this thing up on the screen that shows me doing this work for better and for worse right and i so i love that even in your um in the book the transforming power of affect um you know there are lots of clinical vignettes where you describe work and and it's annotated so you we know as the reader what's going on and but i loved how you even annotated like well this was a place where i totally messed up or <laughs> You know, it's really helpful to to see that, and then to also see after subsequently how what you do about that. You know, how you don't just kind of go off the rails and stay off the rails. 
right or have to get it perfect all the time because right. then we would be in very big trouble right right diana i'm wondering if we can there are obviously so many other things to talk about and the your work is so rich i appreciate you're taking the time to chat with us to get today hopefully we can talk again at some point one topic that's come up several times in this conversation has been the the topic of our defenses or protective strategies and i'm wondering if you could give us some thoughts before we go on how to recognize a defensive strategy like in ourselves and and maybe in someone else and then that next question of like when you recognize it what do you do i I think maybe one of the ways to recognize it in ourselves is that we feel maybe comfortable enough, but nothing happens, <laughs> meaning things don't deepen, things don't open they, you know, it's almost like a conversation that stays somewhat superficial. You know, nobody's making a faux pas, but nobody's learning anything either. It's a little boring, maybe. Conversationally, that's the equivalent of sort of keeping safe, but too safe so safe that there's no exchange, right? So it'd be some version of that, the sense of, okay, I stayed safe, but nothing happened. I didn't connect. I didn't learn. I didn't take chances. Um, and I think the opposite of that feels a little, whatever one's version is, a little breathless, a little risky, a little scary, a little exciting, um, a little bit like you don't exactly know what you're going to say next, right? I'm describing, I'm trying to describe sort of qualities of... Um, My best podcast interviews. <laughs> <laughs> right. Right, right. When you ask the question to which you really don't know the answer yet. Yeah. Uh, as opposed to the, right, either way, in, in both ways. And similarly, you recognize that in somebody, that if, if you walk out of, you know, of an encounter, uh, get together, and you're not moved or you haven't learned anything or you're leaving much as you came, that's a pretty good indication that everybody's nice and protected and nobody got hurt and nobody got shamed, but nobody connected. <laughs> yeah, and so if I recognize that's going on, two questions come up for me. One is the like, yeah, what do I, okay, what do I do about that? The second is like, are there hints of how I could discover what, what's the core experience that my defenses are actually protecting me against to know myself more deeply? You know, there's actually a book that, um, was written by a colleague of mine, um, which um, does a wonderful, wonderful job of talking about that um, outside of the therapeutic situation. She actually uses examples from therapy, but she uses examples of therapy to help people identify their own defenses and their own emotions. Um, it's called It's Not Always Depression, mm. and uh, the author is uh, Hilary Jacobs Hendel, H-E-N-D-E-L. So um, that might be 
a very, very good recommendation about how to sort of um, apply this stuff to oneself. Um, you know, and I think the other is that we know. We know when we're avoiding grief. Uh, not always, but a fair amount of the time. We know that we're trying not to be angry. We know that we're trying to pretend that we're not anxious or afraid. I think there's a fair amount of knowing what we're trying not to feel when we're trying to not feel it. Right? I'm talking about sort of ordinary interactions rather than sort of deep-seated drama, right, that sort of necessarily takes us to therapy. But in our daily interactions, I think we have a pretty good idea of, in some part of our mind, of these core experiences, core emotions that we're trying to not go near because we're scared of them or they make us feel too vulnerable. Yeah, I could see even asking yourself the question in that moment of just asking yourself, what am I, what am I avoiding by doing this thing that I always do, this engaging in this habit or, um, and being open to the answer that arises there. Right, right. If I weren't talking so much now, or if I weren't just asking the other person questions about him or herself, what I might, what might I be feeling? Mm. You know, whatever one's particular strategy is. Who? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm. I'm. My sigh in that moment is just a recognition of like as much as. I myself am, am an optimist. I, I try to dwell in, you know, the gratitude and, and all of that. But I recognize, yeah, there's there are a lot of places where there's pain or there's anger or there's disappointment or um and and I I'm feeling for all of you listening the blessing, hopefully, in allowing yourself to feel more of that so that you get the richness that's on the other side of metabolizing those things in your life. Diana, um, I, I really appreciate your taking the time to be here with us today. And um, what's the best way for people who want to learn a little bit more about AEDP or therapists who might want to get some training in that modality? What's the best way for people to find out more about you and your work? Yes, thank you for asking that. I think that um, we have a very rich website. Um, the URL is www.aedpinstitute.org, A-E-D-P Institute, one word, lowercase. And there is a lot about AEDP. Um, there are a lot of papers that people can download for free by myself and by my colleagues who teach in the ADP Institute. And there's a lot of stuff on our trainings. Um, I myself teach an immersion course, which is a five-day intensive, uh, which I teach several times a year. The next one is coming up at the end of January in Florida. Um, and there are other courses. We have skills courses and so on and so forth. And we have a therapist directory <laughs> where we might look for somebody that you or other people who are interested in this might see. And um, so I would highly, highly recommend that people who want to know more about it um, either for therapeutic training or just to learn a bit more about the approach, uh, really go to our website and it has references to all of my books and videotapes and just a whole bunch of different kinds of resources. Great. And we will have all those links on the show notes, um, which you can get, again, if you visit neilsatin.com slash FOSHA, F-O-S-H-A. 
And uh, so we'll have a link to aedpinstitute.org. And you can also download a transcript of this conversation to study it again and again. Unfortunately, we won't have a videotape for you to watch. <laughs> a videotape. You're picking up my antiquated language. <laughs> <laughs> Diana Fosha, thank you so much for being here with us today. Such a treat to be able to talk with you. Neil, thank you so much. This was one of those conversations, much like we we're talking about, that doesn't feel flat and it goes to unexpected places, which makes it feel lively. And I'm really, really appreciating this chance to share this work and you're really having gotten to know it. So thank you so much. Mm, you're welcome. And the pleasure is totally mine, I think. Well, maybe not totally, but quite, a, quite so. a bit mine. <laughs> Thank you for listening to another episode of Relationship Alive. If you like what you've heard and want to make it easier for other people to find out about us, please take a moment to subscribe to our podcast and to rate and review us on iTunes. If you have questions or comments or want to continue the conversation, you can always join our Relationship Alive community Facebook group. And for more information about today's episode, visit us online at neilsatin.com slash podcast. Or you can always text the word PASSION, P-A-S-S-I-O-N, to the number 33444 for more information. Finally, do you have a burning question that you're hoping we can have answered here on Relationship Alive, either for a future or past guest? Let me know and I'll see what I can do. Take care and see you next time.